Hey listeners, this podcast needs your support. I love doing this and think it's important work and conversations to share with you, but it takes time, money, and resources to make it happen. I would love to expand the podcast in season two, but I need your help. Would you consider supporting this podcast with a donation? Go to our website, wdtatpodcast.com, and click on support. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your support. In this episode, I talked to Luis Matias Cruz about growing up Zapotec in Oaxaca, falling in love, and moving to the United States. There's also a bonus episode in Spanish, and the interview is way better, just to make the gringos jealous. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about things we're not supposed to, learn how to have difficult conversations, and talk to people about what makes them different. This is the We Don't Talk About That with Lucas Land podcast where we do talk about that with me, Lucas Land. It's never the right place or time. It's imperceptible to the eye. Never the right place or time. Hi, Louise. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So just to tell people a little bit about yourself, um, you are from Oaxaca, Mexico, where you currently live, and you're a professor of sustainable economics and culture in Oaxaca City. Yes. yes. And you're also a pastor of Casa de Esperanza, and you live in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Okay. Yes, that's correct. You keep going. You keep going. I keep saying yes. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things I was interested in, in hearing about from you is a little bit about what it was like growing up in Mexico, and in particular, being from a Zapotec background. What what was it like for you growing up? Well, first of all, the the my family uh, came from the mountains when we were little. And some of my brothers were born, well, one of them was, was born uh, in the valley of Oaxaca, but not in the city. And then all the brothers and sisters were born in the city of Oaxaca. So we came to a place where Spanish was the official language, still is. It was, at that time, I couldn't understand what was what was the meaning of uh, living in Oaxaca and being a Zapotec family? But now, looking back, I can articulate or put words to those experiences. Uh, for example, one of them was that we were speaking Zapotec at home, um, and one day, when I was eight or ten years old, my father came home and said that um said to my mom not to speak Zapotec, not to use Zapotec in the family anymore. Otherwise the kids uh will not learn how to speak Spanish well. And so speaking Spanish well was better for all of us according to my father, because then people will accept us, people will not laugh at us or and we will have more chances for survival in the city. That process was very interesting. Uh, the language and also the clothing and the way that we uh, spoke or relate to one another, all of a sudden we started changing everything. We started imitating the families, mm. the, uh, uh, the or neighbors in the city. At the school, instead of taking sandals, I was taking now uh, plastic boots which somehow look more civilized than sandals. <laughs> it was horrible. I mean, it was, the temperatures were so high and using pla- wearing plastic was not fun at all. But also our hair, the food that we took to school changed. Uh, many things. It was the living in Oaxaca, growing up as a Zapotec, was strange and weird and sad it was sad Mm. i didn't know why but it was sad Mm. and now that i teach culture i know that process is called um ethnocide 
which means when when people that are imi- arriving to a new society, dominating society, they are convinced that in order to make it, they have to stop being themselves mm. somehow. Otherwise, they will not make it. We did it. I did it. And now I'm, I'm trying to rec- kind of going back and trying to recover the yeah. language and culture. Well, I imagine... When when that happens, when that happens, where you kind of suppress your culture to fit in to the dominant culture, it never goes away. It's it's not like it. You can suppress it, but it's still in some ways there. You still know that you never quite entirely fit in, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's still there. Yeah. You know that's still there, but it's a cause of shame. And it's uh, and it's like you carrying this secret. Nobody should see because otherwise they will know that you are not with them, and so probably you are less. Uh, you are um, ignorant and all that prejudice mm-hmm. yeah. against you know uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, for um, for me at least. Uh, and I have talked to other people. It seems like it's almost the same experience that we shared. Then the knowledge or the awareness that you are you you have a indigenous culture, a Zapotec culture in you, in your heart. Uh, for some reason, you start not just hiding that from others, but yeah. hating it, almost like hating that. Because you cannot get rid of it. I don't know. It's strange, but when I had friends, uh, elementary school and secondary school, and they would come to my house to visit me, but I didn't want them to see my parents. I didn't want them to hear my parents talking because they were still using the mm. Zapotec language. I was all of a sudden more aware mm-hmm. and more uh, conscious that we had to stop be themselves. It, it was not until university that I started yeah. learning that, that that there was no reason to to be ashamed or to hate things about me, my culture. Well, and tell me, you know, you and I uh, yes. first met in in Waco, Texas. We were part of a church together there in Waco, and I don't I don't think so. We've known each other for for a long time. But I don't know if I've ever heard the story of how how you then moved to the U.S. Um, was it to go to university? No, no. Actually, I um, when I was in Mexico City, I stayed with a family. Uh, the the man was from Ohio, and the wife was from Brazil, and they allowed me to stay in the house with the understanding that I was going to help them build in their house mm-hmm. in lieu of payment. So my payment was contributing labor to build the house in this poor neighborhood in Mexico City. They had a church, the house church there. Uh, Lindy, who was the man from Ohio, Lindy um, wanted to go, wanted to travel. He loved traveling and he was invited to speak in different places. And so he asked me to to stay in the, in the church uh, many weekends, I end up taking care of the pastor in the congregation. Mm-hmm. And one day, one, one day he said, you know, I'm going to bring help for you. And he brought this girl from Ohio, from Athens, Ohio, to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she spoke Spanish well and she sang and so we started working in the church together. We really liked singing together, so we decided to sing together forever. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, I need to go back to the States. Uh, I've been offered a scholarship for my master's degree. So when she left, I went, I went after her. That was the reason. It was a lot. Mm-hmm. love for this girl that I met. So I went to, to the States, um, to Houston, uh, to Ohio, I'm sorry, went to, to Ohio, and um, and then we got married, and um, we ended up living in Ohio for some time, seven years or so. 
So, but that was the reason. <clears throat> it's a great story. And you and uh, you and your wife Ramona, who who passed away in in 2007, you guys would travel back to Mexico and work on this house that you have now in in Oaxaca. Yes, yes, that's correct. We we decided to um, start building a house here in Oaxaca because we wanted to do something here in Oaxaca. She wanted to work with midwives, be an apprentice and also hopefully become a midwife. And so she was very interested uh, working with midwives in, in Oaxaca, indigenous women. And I, I was also interested in working in a project and here uh, in education. At that time, we didn't know what, but also we knew that we wanted to have also a congregation here in Oaxaca. So every summer we came to Oaxaca with the kids as they were being born. We, we started bringing uh, a Wendelin, who was the oldest, and then, um, and then Paloma. And so the kids will spend every year two months, at least two months, and, and here in Oaxaca. The, we wanted them to be bicultural, bilingual. And I'm still building the house. <laughs> <laughs> Finishing some, repairing some stuff in the house. So, so in 2012, uh, we decided to, I decided to move back to Mexico, to Oaxaca. So here we are. And, and two years after that, I was lucky enough to get to come visit you guys and spend about four days uh, with you to celebrate this this library that you had created on the, the third floor yes. of the house. Yes. That we had brought some books and sent books from, from Texas to this library. As a Mennonite, for those for people that don't know, Mennonites are um, one of the historic peace churches. Um, so this library also had a lot of books about peace and justice conflict resolution, things like that. And what I, I remember is you saying that there were a lot of these books that you couldn't find anywhere else in, in Mexico. You didn't know of other places that where these books were available. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so some of the books I got from, uh, since I was teaching uh, uh, the university in the States, in uh, various places I uh, was teaching. Uh, many times uh, I was um, uh, sent to conferences and also, I mean, myself, uh, I wanted to participate in conferences in, in various countries in Latin America. So every time that I went to a, a country in, in Latin America, I will just look for books and um, and get those books for the library here in Oaxaca. So um, some titles um, that we have lost here, I've been uh, looking for them, and uh, that's how I know that they don't they they are not available in Mexico. They have to pay or bring them from mm -hmm. other countries. For you, for you growing up in in Mexico and and with your family, you know, starting in a, a Zapotec culture and then needing to transition. What 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 did you learn from your family growing up about how to deal with conflict? Well, one of the things that I didn't know, and then later I find out found out that uh, it was uh, it was an advantage, is that in the mountains with the Zapotec and the Zapotec villages, still whenever there is a, a problem between, say, two people, like let me tell you the story. This man mm -hmm. uh, in the mountains was. Uh, driving a, a truck and uh, he was drunk and he was as he was driving the truck uh, lost control of the of the wheel and somehow the truck ended up and uh, uh, damaging a roof of a house the, the path was where the truck was going it was almost at the same level than the a house that was built by in the village. And here in Oaxaca, the, to solve that issue of uh, the damage and the, 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 the issue of, uh, you know, the, the, the man was drunk and driving under the influence, 
uh, here in Oaxaca, to solve that problem would take long, and will be a long process. In, 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 in the village, the authorities, the, the men, the older men, and the older women in charge in the village, they call the men and they call the family and they put them together there in, in, a, in a room and they were asking questions, what happened? And so both parties were had the chance to talk and then they said, how much will that be to repair your house? And then the, the the family, the man and the family say, well, this much. And, and the driver said, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm to blame. Uh, I was drunk and, and they're okay. So let's settle this. You will, uh, well, I don't have money. The driver said, I don't have money. Okay. You don't have money, but you have, you can, you can help rebuilding the house. He said, yes, yes. So, so, so he started coming and fixing the house. And, the materials and and that was it. That was settled. No paperwork, hmm. nothing. So the one thing that I learned was uh, if we can talk and we can mm -hmm. just uh, we can work together in the process, uh, we can find a way. There is a there, there is this name for it in in, in, in the village. And it's called El Caminito, El Camino path or the way. So let's find a way, because there is a way, there is a path where we can walk together and find a solution. Yeah. So in Oaxaca the, the, uh, and, the, and this with other people that it's been really helpful to notice that the, the people how, sometimes they don't know, they don't have the skills because they have never belonged to a community or a village. So it's, it's, it's been uh, interesting to, to see how uh, conflicts can be solved without violence and, and, and making it simple and short. One of the things that that story makes me think of is, is all of the layers that we sort of build up between us and the people we might have a conflict with. So we have yeah. police and court systems. We have systems of laws and those are all meant to be there to protect us but a lot of times they're they they get almost between people and what your you know your story was very simple working out this conflict between people face to face yeah. it almost makes me wonder how often <laughs> the way that we've sort of structured life and society how often are we really having to do that uh, solve our conflicts and our problems face to face. Yeah. There's so many ways to avoid having to do that now. It seems like, like you said, like it's a it's a lost skill. Yes, uh, there is now in Chiapas and other states. There are other villages now that uh, there is a conflict. They they ask the two parties. They said, do you want to solve it here in the village, the traditional way, or do you want to go to this to the municipality in the city to solve it with lawyers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go there, that's up to you guys. If you want to solve it there, or uh, well, you need money to, to pay over there, and and it's going to be it's going to take longer. But if you do it here in the village, we can solve it right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so people now in the, all the villages, uh, like in Chiapas, they have the option now. To go with with uh, the city city way, the the, the non-indigenous ways, uh, mm -hmm. indigenous way. What's a, what was a time, Luis, that you remember changing your mind about something, and and what happened? Well, one of the things that I that I uh, that I can remember right now it comes to my mind is when uh, when we started meetings here at the church, uh, house mm -hmm. church. Um, I didn't know, but all of a sudden I had, I don't know, uh, maybe 10, 12, and sometimes more young people. I mean, very young guys and young girls. Mm -hmm. And actually those, those guys were who became the, 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 say the basis of the congregation mm -hmm. and, uh, the founders. They were, they were the founders and they, we became a church. We were not just a group or getting together, but we became a church. All of them were so young. 
And I, and I thought, this is great. It's wonderful. But I didn't know. But later on, uh, three years later, we, I started noticing that, uh, that most of them were falling in love with each other. <laughs> <laughs> That happens. So, <laughs> so I, I start now thinking, are they coming to the meetings because we are a church? <laughs> or are they <laughs> coming to the meetings because they're in love? They want to see each other every day, including Sunday. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I changed my mind. Well, I, I thought at the beginning, this is great, we're going to bring more youth, more, but later I thought, you know, maybe we should start <laughs> opening, <laughs> the, the, uh, making this space more <clears throat> welcoming for, for families, yeah. not just for young people, yeah. and for children too. Well, I think it's something we, we all have to do. Personally, with my, my personality, I'm often very quick to judge. Yeah. A situation or people think that I know and understand everything that's going on. So often, like you're saying, something happens, all of a sudden you notice that they're all pairing off and <laughs> falling in love and you realize, oh, this isn't what I thought it was or it, what I thought was happening isn't what what's happening. About that, what you're saying, I remember when I went to the States uh, the first time and I didn't know English. Mm-hmm. And I came uh, landed in, in in Houston, and I was supposed to supposed to land in in, uh, in Houston uh, around eight thirty nine p.m. and then move to another airport, the Intercontinental Airport, which was forty five minutes away from the Houston International, the George Bush International, and so I was supposed to. Uh, meet a friend in Houston uh, between flights, be- and that this friend was going to help me to get a taxi to go to the other airport, and 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 put me in the other flight. This guy, this friend, and also pay for the for my ticket. Uh, anyway, all that was a plan that was uh, designed by by my future mother-in-law at that time for the wedding. When I landed there, they asked me, uh, the guys, the, the officers, they asked me uh, where I was going. And I said, Ohio. And they said, uh, in Spanish, one of them said, how much money, cuánto dinero tienes? Mm. How much money do you have in your pocket, cash? And I said, uh, 20, $20. And I said, well, my, my friend, and I was telling them in Spanish, my friend, I have phone number here to call. My friend is waiting for me here. Mm-hmm. And, he, and, and I don't know if they understood or not. But then they took me, um, they asked me to wait. And then three or four officers came to me and they started searching in my bag. And they asked me to take my shoes off and my shirt and checking everything. And, and they found this check. From Mexico that I couldn't cash uh, uh, before I, I, I left to, to Houston. They found this check and they, they were passing out a check to each other and asking me things in English. Apparently, the guy who could speak Spanish at the entrance was not present. There were three or four and they they were just addressing me in English. And I, I said uh, I couldn't, I was in Spanish. That check, I couldn't cash it. So I brought it. I don't know if I can cash it here in the States. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But they were, they just kept me there for two, three hours wow. in that corner. And I didn't understand what was happening. And then later he, they came and said, um, the, 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 the problem, the, the, the problem is you check. I don't know. I don't know why the check is a problem. And then one of them said something and, and they said, uh, Dollars or pesos, they asked me. I said, pesos. Oh, they went like, saw the light. Oh, Uh apparently they were seeing the numbers, (laughs) thinking they were $150,000. Yeah, that's a lot of zeros. Everything, but everything was in Spanish. 
So the bank was in Spanish. I mean, all the lettering and all the legends were in Spanish. So I, uh, and they said, okay. Uh, I mean, they, they signing, making signs, they said to pick up my stuff and leave. So, so I went out and I thought, this is horrible. They thinking that they, they are thinking wrong about me. Yeah. They, they are so, so, so ignorant. I was so mad and angry. I, I lost my flight. My friend left. I was trying to call and then I went to looking for a phone. And uh, I didn't have uh, uh, coins, so I have just this twenty-dollar bill. And I saw this uh, African American man cleaning the floors and one of the gates. And I said, um, "Please help, money, phone." Mm -hmm. And I showed him my bill. He took my bill, and he left. Oh. <laughs> and I said, "I said." Oh yes, these black people are so. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> like in the movies, they, you know, they're so violent. They took your money. They're liars. They're... <laughs> Man, why did I give my money to this guy? I was, I'm just so stressed. I mean, stress out, and I was not thinking. I just sat there. I didn't know what to do. Didn't have money to call my friend. It was so late. I sat there. And then I see this African American coming back with coins, taking me to the phone, showing me what coin to put there. And I realized I just did what the other guys did to me. I judged this guy wrong. Um, and I realized at that point, you know, uh, it can happen to all of us. Of course, in a different, every situation is, is different, but, but, uh, um, uh, personal level, uh, we are subject to that. And we can see, we can see a reality. We can see a person, but we have to remember that it's not just the words that are operating, operating at that moment. Mm -hmm. there, 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 there's, there, there are ideas, there are, um, memories in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, movies, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, many things that are interfering and working at the same moment mm -hmm. that you are talking to someone. And sometimes we just want to be, to, to pretend that it's just the person and the words and the conversation. But, uh, but actually there are more, more, it's a, a more complex uh, experience when you're talking to someone that is different than you. And it's so it's so important to to remember that we we've all been there, and that like you said, that we're not we're not immune. Um, even as we're trying to be better people, trying to to listen better, to learn, to to pay better attention, it's so easy to do the same things that people have done to us, and to continue those those cycles. We want to wrap up. I like to wrap up with three three things. Um, something we learned uh, from our conversation, something that we can do, that we can tell people uh, an action they can take, and then something to share. could be some kind of resource, uh, a movie, a website, book, and I'll start so you have, you have time to think about your, your three things. Something, something I learned, um, and I really appreciated hearing about growing up, Zapotec and then moving into Spanish speaking Mexican culture was what you said about what happens when we make people hide themselves that it it does a lot of damage and hurts people and and it causes sh shame and a lot of uh difficulties trying to deal with something that's pretty basic about who you are that being where you where you were born and and what language you learned and the culture that you were given as a child and saying that it's not okay and so being aware of that and trying to to be more aware of ways that we make people hide uh, themselves um, and something we can do I think maybe the the flip side of that lesson is to learn from people and value what makes them different or what makes them themselves and instead of trying to make people hide or if we realize we are making people hide part of who they are 
turning that around to learn from them. If it's someone who speaks a different language, maybe it's learning phrases in Zapotec. If it's somebody who believes differently, trying to learn something about their their beliefs or their religion, honestly being curious about other people uh, rather than making those judgments about things um, that are different than us. Um, and one thing I want to share, since we're mentioning Zapotecs and other indigenous people, I discovered maybe a couple of years ago someone had created an indigenous map of uh, North America. And they they made several different maps that had, instead of having states and place names that were the modern current place names, they had the tribal territories of the different places throughout North America. And then they had uh, maps that were just of the territory of the United States um, and I think of Canada and Mexico maybe. Um, but I'll share a link to that in the in the show notes so people can find that. I bought a copy. They're not super cheap, but I really like maps. Maps also form how we think about the world. And so I, I really appreciated having that map to think about who lived in these places that I now live. And mm. in, in many cases still live, maybe not in the same place that was their original territory, but those those same groups of people, many of them are still alive but may have been displaced and moved to other places. Anyway, so I, I recommend that map because it I, I think maps form how we think about the world. So, Luis, uh, what did you, what's something you learned, what's something we could do, and what's something you want to share? Okay, I think uh, one, one thing that I have learned is the, that, uh, well, we can, all of us, I mean, everybody can, can uh, keep learning about... Uh, other other people, their background, their history. That uh, I think one of the things that I I I wanted to do when I was little, it was to educate people about the Zapotec culture. But then I uh, I got tired. <laughs> there were so many people. <laughs> so so I think one one thing that I have learned is that. To invite people to learn, to to read, uh, to have conversations, and to visit, to cross the cultural boundaries, not just the geographical boundaries, but the cultural mm-hmm. boundaries. So, uh, and, and about myself, I learned also that I I, uh, I can do the same thing to to other people. I can shame other people. I can. Mm. Ignore their history, ignore their their background, their heritage. Okay, something that we can do, I think, is to ask simple questions. Uh, I mean, to meditate, to to ask ourselves questions, such as, um, do I do I feel myself? Do, am I convinced that as a person I'm more capable than other people? Mm. Uh, if if we are convinced of that, really convinced that we are more capable, then when we meet someone, we will be tempted to show that, to carry out that, and so in that way, uh, we are again displacing other people, uh, um, not giving room for other people to show their capabilities, their abilities. The other question that I think is really helpful is that um, to if I kind of uh, minimize the, the the experience of other people, if I minimize the experience of other people, then uh, their history becomes uh, insignificant or less significant than mine. Their experiences are not so. If somebody comes and says, let's say no, no, to pay, to Put it simple, if a woman comes to me and say, um, I just got out of a taxi and the driver uh, was uh, uh, telling me, uh, you know, sexual things, uh, but, you know, uh, bothering me with um, um, with, with things that I, I, don't, I didn't want to hear. I, I feel abused. I, 
And mm. if I don't hear that experience, if I don't value that experience, and I minimize that experience, such as, well, you know, that happens all the time. Mm. It happened to other friends too. It happened to my sister too. So, so that way, I'm kind of minimizing that experience. Uh, that experience becomes relative. We keep doing the same thing. We we are not listening to people. So yeah. that's something that we can do. We can we can really actively listen to people and value their experience. Whether it's oppression, whether it's it's a you know a happy thing or and something that I can recommend is um, well there's several things that I that I can recommend but right now something comes to my mind is a movie called uh, Even the Rain. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. Even the Rain was done in Bolivia and in Bolivia with the uh, water war, mm-hmm. the water crisis. Um, and it's a good film. It's a film within a film. Um, they wanted to the original um, actors in the movie. They wanted to to do this this um, to to film this movie about the, the 1492 with the arrival of the Spaniards into the Caribbean, and um, and since they couldn't find indigenous peoples, the Taínos in the Caribbean, and they decided to go to Bolivia, and they did it in Bolivia. And it's interesting because uh, the same story kinds of repeats in, uh, during the war, the water crisis in Bolivia. Because mm-hmm. now companies were trying to do business in Bolivia with the water, and people were protesting. And so anyway, that that movie is an excellent. Uh, even the rain. I love that movie. And for those that haven't seen it, Gail Garcia Bernal is uh, one of the main actors. And so if you like him, it's a great movie. Although if you don't, if you don't speak Spanish, you re- I mean, or if you're, if Spanish is your second language, you're really going to need subtitles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Their Spanish in that movie was so fast. I could hardly understand <laughs> Some of the <laughs> scenes, what was happening around the table, because they just, oh, they were talk so fast. Yeah, yeah. And there is a, a, a book, uh, it comes to my mind right now, it's called, uh, um, in Spanish, it's called uh, Mexico Profundo, Profound Mexico. Yeah. The, the author is called, uh, the author, last name is Batalla. Batalla, and I think it's also trans- been translated into English and other languages. Uh, deep Mexico or uh, profound Mexico, and it is about it is about uh, how Mexicans tend to we tend to uh, look toward toward the north to Europe, and we kind of deny our deep roots and in the indigenous uh, tradition, the indigenous uh, um, ways of life, and we kind of deny that. And uh, we are now reconciled with our past, with our ethnic background, with our traditions, and we tend to look outside mm-hmm. um, and how we do it and why we do it. Um, uh, it's an interesting reading, and also my book. Uh-huh. <laughs> Can I read my book? Sure, definitely. <laughs> uh, my book is uh, it's called. Um, it is available in the internet. Is repressions and rebellions in southern Mexico, the search for a political economy of dignity, and uh, it is available. and It tells you the story about the conquest and also the um, the uprising of indigenous peoples in uh, in, in Mexico in Chiapas, and also the whole violent and armed movements. In southern Mexico in general, mm-hmm. and why is that? So he connect try to try to explain connects economics with with violence, uh, uh, collective violence. Yeah. Why people suddenly decides to take a weapon in their hands? Well, I I those are on my list to read, and I will add them with links in the show notes so people can find those. 
with that, I want to thank you for, for your time, Luis, and for sharing so much of yourself, your stories with us. Anyways, thank, thanks so much for, for your time. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. I hope you found it helpful. If you enjoyed it, please help us spread the word by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Many thanks to Neil Curran and Infielder for the use of their music. You can find more of their music online at infielder.bandcamp.com. We would love to hear from you and get your feedback on the show or future topic ideas. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WDTAT Podcast or email us at WDTAT Podcast at gmail.com. A final thought from Brené Brown. The willingness to show up changes us. It makes us a little braver each time. Until next time, keep showing up and keep being brave. What are you gonna do?